Hey, hello everyone, and welcome to this discussion of the catastrophic situation of, in Syria. We're going to be focusing on the humanitarian situation, and I'm delighted that you two can join us. We have Shelley Pitterman, the regional representative of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees here in Washington. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you very much, Beth. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm joined by my colleague, Megan Bradley, who works with me in the Brookings LSE Project on Internal Displacement. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Beth. When we look at the overall situation of humanitarian life in, in Syria, the, the situation is devastating. The number of casualties, at least 70,000 people, more than 5 million people displaced, either internally within Syria's borders or across borders as, as refugees. And there is no end in sight to the carnage. The political leaders seem unable to figure out what to do in Syria to bring an end to this horrific violence. And so once again, we see that when political leaders can't act, the humanitarian actors have the brunt of the responsibility. Shelley, you've worked with refugees most of your life. What can you tell us about the Syrians who are fleeing across the borders into neighboring countries? Uh, Beth, thanks a lot. The, it, the, the numbers you've already cited, the numbers are really quite extraordinary, and it's not the actual numbers, it's the growth that's quite unprecedented. Uh, we had planned, uh, to the extent that you can plan for these uh, developments, we had planned for something on the order of one and a half million refugees and already at, as at the end of June and we've we've had already one one and a half million refugees almost now um, the, the financial requirements are, are extraordinary um, happily we've re been receiving some late donations uh, and so overall the response to the global appeal has been uh, more positive but it goes beyond the money even uh, in, a recent, uh, in a recent commentary, the, the heads of the UN organizations have mm -hmm. said, we need a political solution. Uh, otherwise, the, this is an unsustainable situation uh, in the medium term. But that having been said, the people continue to flow uh, at, the, at the order of seven, 8,000 people per day into the, into the neighboring countries. And the displacement internally uh, is happening as we speak, obviously, as the conflict shifts between neighborhoods within cities or across lines. And where are they going? What countries are they going to? They're going to, uh, to Jordan, we've read a lot about it, to Jordan, to Turkey, to Lebanon, to Egypt. There are 26,000 who have uh, approached uh, European countries for asylum. Uh, there's, the, the movement is spreading, but it's, it's concentrated in Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. And the approaches of each of the countries has been quite different uh, in relation to uh, their settlement in camps. For example, in Lebanon, they're mostly outside of camps, whereas in Jordan, um, while only a quarter of the refugees are actually in camps, there are now three, um, the, the focus of international attention has been on the situation in the camps. Uh, in Turkey, uh, most of the refugees, about 60 percent of the almost half a million refugees, are, are now in camps. And does that make any difference, Megan, if they live in camps or they don't? Well, it makes actually quite a significant difference. So um, as Shelley mentioned, there's been a real diversity in terms of how the host countries have managed the refugee situation. In Lebanon, uh, the policy has been not to encamp refugees. Instead, refugees have had the opportunity to try to find a home in cities and towns across the country. Uh, Turkey has promoted camps much more um, prominently in their response, and amongst the IDPs, uh, the vast majority are in fact not living in camps. We have informal camps established uh, right. often along the border, particularly uh, to Turkey, because the border entry has been controlled. So people are living in informal settlements where the conditions are, are appalling. So people have lack of access to adequate food, water, sanitation, security problems are severe. Oftentimes we see that these camps uh, whether they're formal or informal, become the target of attacks uh, from a, a wide range of actors. So are people better off in camps, or are they better off living on their own with host families? Well, if we look at the history of responses to displacement situations around the world, we see that typically people
people do fare much better when they have the opportunity to live outside of camps. Camps are an important part of the humanitarian response, particularly in an emergency setting like this one. Uh, when there's a massive outflow, it can be an important part of managing such a large number of people, but it's absolutely essential that people have the right to free movement, whether they're in the country or in host states. That's an important part of making sure that people can access livelihoods, that they can normalize their lives. And this, this, if I may, uh, yeah. Beth, it's so important in, in that environment outside the camps, like in Lebanon or even, like I said, the majority of the refugees in Jordan, that there be opportunities for them to pay the rent or to go to yeah. for their kids to go to school. Don't forget that more than three quarters of the of the refugees are, are women and children. And this is really about the children and about the next generation of Syrians. But if there if the economic environment allows for the refugees outside of the camps to make ends meet, then that's right. also for UNHCR historically better, provided that there is protection um, for the for the refugees. And we see now um, we see now that there's increasing stress uh, in the host countries as the numbers of refugees is continues to grow. Sure, and you hear from the governments that this is a burden, it's an economic cost, that it's penalizing their own citizens to mm -hmm. care for the right. I mean, what are the limits of solidarity? I mean, is that an important role the international community plays in terms of providing resources to these strapped governments to enable them to continue to welcome refugees? Sure. Well, it's a critical part of, of the international community's responsibility, both to the refugees and to the IDPs. What we see is that so often the focus of the media, of international actors, is on the camps. And there can be reasons for that, but it's important that we not overlook the ways in which the international community can provide support to the families and communities that are hosting uh, those who are living outside of camps in particular. So this entails sometimes taking a more development-oriented approach. So we're supporting the schools that welcome displaced children. We're supporting uh, places of work that uh, open up opportunities to the displaced sanitation facilities, healthcare facilities that can really be strapped by such a large influx of displaced persons. So it's important that the international community make clear that they're out to support not just the displaced but also the communities mm. that have been affected by displacement. In the, in the Beka Valley, for example, in Lebanon, UNHCR, and it's not just UNHCR, we work very closely with WFP, with UNICEF. There are 62 partners uh, working uh, in the field uh, in response uh, to the refugee situation, to be to be generic about it, although it's really almost reaching uh, catastrophic proportions. Um, but in the case of Lebanon, there are lots of quicks, quips, uh, quick action projects that are being implemented, for example, by the Danish Refugee Council, just to, to bring generators, to bring water pumps, mm -hmm. to bring uh, uh, better schools that benefit both the, the host community as well as the refugees in impacted areas. You know, in spite of all the difficulties of assisting refugees in neighboring countries, isn't it more difficult to work with those who are displaced internally? I mean, who is looking after IDPs? Are you involved, Shelley? UNHCR is definitely involved. Uh, it's, it's along, again, nothing is being done in isolation. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be done meaningfully in isolation. Uh, toward the beginning, at the beginning of this year, and as from January, we began UNHCR to cross lines. Um, there and have those lines are shifting, aren't those they? Lines those lines are shifting all the time. There was a convoy that left from Holmes uh, the, on the 17th of April, for example. WFP, UNICEF, and a number of other organizations were engaged. They had to go 25 kilometers outside of Holmes, cross four government-controlled checkpoints to get into the opposition controlled areas and and the, the the plans for that convoy which benefited uh, 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 the population of a town of about 50,000 people just 10 kilometers north of of, uh, of homes it took them I don't know 10 hours to get there at six miles yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. wow 10 hours okay but uh, to bring blankets to bring drugs to bring uh, uh, food of course that's right. those are the principal commodities and UNHCR is has touched 100,000 families through these arrangements. And of course, there are other, there are other actors um, uh, trying to get as much access as possible. But there isn't a, a firm distinction to be made by uh, rebel or opposition controlled and the people who are in the government controlled areas. It, it doesn't reflect necessarily the affiliation of the people right. because the needs are going to be the same 
dramatic uh, in either circumstance. And I think we all owe a debt of gratitude to the Syrian Arab Red Crescent Society, which Absolutely. has taken the lead in, inside Syria in very difficult political situations to try to reach people on both sides. But it's, it's really difficult. Security, access, all these humanitarian issues are right in the forefront. And sure. I think that there's also a debt of gratitude to those NGOs who are doing the very difficult work of delivering assistance across borders. So this is a critical right. part of responding to the needs of the internally displaced populations who can't always be met by the convoys that are moving within the countries that have to go through these very complicated um, security provisions that are laid out by the Syrian government. So this work is, is incredibly risky, it's um, dangerous, and People the NGOs die, yeah. mm -hmm. who are involved can't necessarily speak openly about it, but it's an important part of uh, making sure that we respond to the needs of those who are displaced and otherwise in need within Syria. Can you say a word, Megan, about the particular needs of Syrian women? displaced or within Syria? Mm -hmm. Well, we've seen that uh, sexual violence has been an increasing part of the conflict. Uh, it's being used as a weapon of war. It's very difficult to get any kind of accurate statistics about the number of people, men and women, also children, who've been exposed to sexual and gender-based violence as part of the conflict. But uh, the International Rescue Committee, for example, has done surveys amongst those who've been displaced into Jordan and Lebanon and have reported that fear of sexual and gender-based violence is one of the uh, predominant reasons for displacement. Um, in her recent report to the Security Council, the representative of the Secretary General on Violence Against Women uh, made a really impassioned plea for greater attention to this issue, for more support uh, for the survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. So that includes medical care, but also psychosocial uh, support, counseling services. It's also important that we make clear from the outset that these are not crimes for which uh, impunity can be tolerated. I, mean, I think that in any humanitarian situation, you see that those who are most weak and vulnerable often bear the brunt of the violence and effects of the conflict. But can things get worse? Is there a worst case scenario? Not, not to be too cheerful, but. <laughs> um, the situation, I think, is, is uh, risking continuous degradation. Uh, um, and each, each month, we see that we're up to the challenge of responding to the, uh, con you know, to the to the increasing challenge of accessing and then uh, assisting the the populations. And I would just add that, you know, when it comes to the populations, to the women and children of concern, it's it's individual case work. Mm -hmm. It's not you know mass distributions of victims That's of right. gender-based violence. Each one requires care and attention. And that requires a lot of time, resources, uh, and, and consideration. It'll get, uh, we, don't, we don't want to anticipate the absolute worst, but we can all imagine uh, that, it, uh, that it can trigger uh, in massive displacements, it can have political consequences for the countries that are neighboring uh, Syria, and so there's really a need for some political Conclusion. Political solutions are needed. The humanitarians can't do this alone. You know, Syria with a population of 22 million people, almost 6 million displaced, 8 or 9 million in need of assistance. It's hard to anticipate things getting much worse, but they, they well could. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hate to end on this depressing note, yeah, but really. that is Syria, and mm -hmm. that is the humanitarian situation today. Thank you both, Megan Bradley from Brookings and Shelley Pitterman from UNHCR, for this conversation. Thank you.